Welcome to this session of the World Economic Forum in Latin America. Today, we are going to be addressing a topic that is of great importance. Cities, intelligent cities, what defines them? We have experts with us today that are going to help us define this concept of smart cities. This discussion is being broadcast live on NTN24, and we welcome our audience that's with us today. Those who are also watching through live streaming here in the Riviera Maya. Before we begin, I want to give you two numbers that are fundamental to understand the discussion we have today in Latin America. It is the second most urbanized region of the planet. In 2010, the urbanization rate was 79 percent. It was 64 in 1960. If this trend continues, about 90 percent of the continent will be urbanized will be living in cities. This will be 90% of the region. This means that cities like Mexico, like Medellin, or Phoenix, whose uh, mayors are here today, are going to have serious challenges that they will need to face. We are going to introduce these uh, guests who are with us. To the left, Jordi Botifol, the president of Cisco Latin America. Thank you for being here and being willing to offer your point of view. Miguel Ángel Mancera, the mayor of Mexico City, is with us. The city that is the capital of Mexico, Mexico hosting the Economic Forum this year. We have Luis Koopman Geyser, who is the chief executive officer of Siemens Mesoamerica. Thank you for being here. Greg Stanton, the mayor of Phoenix, is with us. And finally, Aníbal Gaviria, who is the mayor of Medellín, one of the most promising cities of Colombia and probably of the American continent. Thank you for being here. Ladies and gentlemen, what is an intelligent city? How do you define an intelligent city? Jordi, digitalization of the country has much to do with the, the ability to digitalize cities. You need to have the infrastructure that can provide an innovative economy and improve the life level. Mr. Mayor, I think a, an intelligent city, and this may be a bit redundant, but it's a city that makes intelligent decisions. I would say that the issue of technology by and of itself comes after the decision making. An intelligent city is a city that focuses on the life of its citizens. That should be the priority. A respect for life and also valuing life, but also improving lifestyle. This is a very simple thing, and we need to give the space that our citizens need. We have to give access to mobility. Our citizens need to be able to have economic mobility. We have to focus on education for all of our citizens. I think the intelligent decisions is how I would define an intelligent city. Others, how should an intelligent city be? Luis? The ability to share information across the city, to make better decisions, to be able to use the information that's there. And, and we've just scratched the surface. We've just begun that process. We're at the beginning. And let me just give you one small example. Smart water systems. I mean, water is precious. With sensors and control systems, you can stop losing, you can find leaks and stop losing precious water, as well as monitor the levels of water to prevent floods. I mean, these are things that with minor investments make major improvements in the lives of cities. Información, inteligencia. México también ve una... Mexico. Do you also see the possibility of having an intelligent city that way? Well, I think this is a city that allows us to have access to all services. This is a city that allows you to have contact with your government, to interact 
with each one of the necessary services that you need. We've had several mentioned. I would add security as well. This is a, what an intelligent city provides. Citizenry that will be able to interact with the police, that will have access to public services so that you can carry out your daily life in a more simple way that allows you to have the infrastructure that is necessary with all the innovation we are seeing. A, an intelligent city must have the infrastructure that is intelligent. It must have the way to have communication and transportation that makes the city accessible to everybody and to have a vision to where it is going. Phoenix, please. Well, I would say you need to be smart about your economic development strategy. You need to build a more innovative uh, economy. That's what this conference, that's where this ec world economy is going, innovation. You need to have an innovation strategy for your own city. You need to have an export strategy. A city like Phoenix uh, needs to be more active uh, as an international player, more involved in the international economy and, and trades. So we need to develop our own uh, trade policy uh, as well. We need to be smart about how to interact with our citizens. Don't just look inside the city for answers, but through hackathons and other ways to get citizens involved in decision making and be truly open-minded to the citizenry and their ideas about how we could run a better city. And for a city like Phoenix in the United States of America, I would say a smart city is one that accepts a new reality. Uh, you can't be relying on Washington, D.C. like maybe cities were in the U.S. for so many years. That relationship is very different. Uh, and so you need to be more independent, more self-reliant, uh, and adopt your own uh, infrastructure policies, infrastructure investment uh, strategies, uh, water system uh, in terms of water preservation, conservation, et cetera. Uh, we need to be much more independent in your decision making. I think all of those elements make a very smart city. Buenos posicionamientos al principio que marca. Well, this is the beginning of our discussion. We have 50 minutes to address the topics that you've brought up, and I would like to focus on four. How do we improve public services? How do we address pollution and reduce emissions? Smart infrastructure and upgraded transportation systems. And all of you here today understand these challenges. But, Mr. Mayor, you were talking about services. Now, interacting with public services in Mexico City. How does the citizen do that? And how have you improved access to these services? The first thing we did in Mexico City was to analyze all of the regulations that are already in place, because regulations create, continue to grow. And in some cases, we were du duplicating, in some cases, triplicating the requirements for certain things. And we had, we went from a huge number of things that you had to do, we cut red tape significantly and have brought it down to under, well under 15,000 or 1,500 different uh, things that have to be done in order to have access to services. We are focusing on making sure that our citizens have the well-being that they need. We don't want them to spend a lot of time trying to access public services. We want to be efficient. This isn't an easy thing to do by any stretch of the imagination because we have to give services to 16 million people. But we can optimize processes using technologies. This is why Mexico City has an innovation lab and in that lab, we have been creating ways to shorten the wait time to get services. Now, it should only, it's going to be excellent if I have access to a service on my smartphone and I don't have to wait 10 minutes. So, improving this relationship with the citizens, this is important, but is important to have public private alliances or partnerships? Now, we have two companies here that have experience in this relationship with large cities in Latin America. I was seeing, you know, to what extent, what kinds of agreements with Siemens or Cisco that you have with large cities like Mexico City, Santiago, Rio de Janeiro. Now, you want to earn money, but also to be at the service of the people by providing technology and solutions that help accelerate this desire to improve services. Jordi, first we have to prioritize 
what we are doing so that we can then digitalize the city. And we need to reach a series of conclusions and using those conclusions to establish priorities. For example, I talked about mobility, the ability to move from one place to another in a city. It's not just a question of productivity and competitiveness. It has to do with well-being as well. If you can provide virtual and physical mobility, you can build an innovation platform that will then create a new ecosystem. And whatever relation you can have between private and public sector has to have a social factor to it. We talked about education here, and that's one of the mixed initiatives that we have working with youth in cities in terms of education. But when we talk about clean energy, we need to ensure that this city is using energy in an optimal, optimal manner. There are many initiatives that could allow us to develop that possibility. Does Phoenix have those kinds of public-private partnerships to improve your public services? Let me give a perfect example. Right now in real time, we've just hired a private company to change every single street light in the city of Phoenix, 90,000 street lights, which is a tremendous number for a city our size. Only because of a public-private partnership will we be able to change those light out to LED lights, saving a tremendous amount of energy, saving a lot of uh, money. It's a very good uh, deal, if you will, for the private company that's going to do that for us. But more importantly, it's good for the citizens of Phoenix. They're going to get better lighting. They're going to feel safer uh, in, their, uh, in their neighborhoods. And we're able to provide that service much faster. The mention earlier was also about water. We, in Phoenix, Arizona, we're in the middle of a desert. We're in the middle of a drought. Only by working with our private sector uh, companies, not only for their ideas, but for their advanced infrastructure, can we really be successful in terms of appropriate water conservation and planning? Those are just two very important examples, but the reality is you can't be a smart city unless you have great public-private partnerships. Medellin también tiene alianzas público-privadas, pero además tiene una empresa que es 100%. Medellin also has PPPs, and you have a company that is 100% public, and you actually uh, are, are happy about that. So I would like to tell us, why aren't you cooperating with the private sector? Well, Medellin has a exemplary PPP uh, model. But as you were saying, Medellin has, um, has become a benchmark in Latin America. We have a company which is called EPN, which is 100% owned by the mayorship of uh, Medellin, or the city of Medellin, and it was created for energy originally, but now they also provide telecom services, so sewage services, gas services, and we have just included the waste management service into the company. And why is it so successful if it is a 100% public uh, company when the purpose is to have PPPs now to make the companies more efficient? Well, basically because it has been managed by a corporate government, a, co a government that is focused 100% on results. So we are result-oriented and we are aiming at complying our sustainability goals and providing good service to the citizens of Medellin, then we are trying to provide services also to the, the Department of Antioquia and then Colombia and then Latin America. So EPM Group is not only providing quality services in Medellin, but it, is, it has also has holdings or investments in Mexico, El Salvador, Guatemala, Panama, and Chile, and we so we, we hope that it will soon ha also have them in uh, Brazil and Peru. And we are providing quality services as we do in Medellin. And the advantage for our cities then that um, in addition to providing the services, we are also creating profits that will transfer those, mon uh, th th those monies and those proceeds for, so for investments in the city. So it is... a uh, we are working under the same principles. The Siemens have the same PPPs. Great examples that are going on right now in Mayor Mansata's city. One is on uh, the electric grid and actually getting smart meters in homes that automatically connect to the grid, which allows that there's no more meter reading. You can control your electricity in your home, and we reduce losses by over 50%. It's 50. 
five zero. That's amazing. That's a big percentage. So these are amazing technologies that make a difference that are connected to a smart grid that self heals. If there's an interruption, it figures out how to route around it and very few people are out of service. On top of that, we have smart buildings in Mexico City. Now that's one piece of the puzzle because with a smart building, you can have resilience in the building. What that means is if there's a disaster, there's control systems that can monitor that. For example, the evacuation stairwells can be pressurized so smoke doesn't come in and people can get out safely. Or you can end up reducing what you do with these systems, electricity consumption, water, waste by over 20%. I mean, these are all pieces of the puzzle that make for a much smarter and much better quality of life. Sustainable. Yes. Alcalde, satisfecho? Bueno, sin ninguna duda. Yo, yo creo que el caso de Medellín... Are you happy with that, Mr. Mayor? Yes, I believe that Medellin is an exceptional case that deserves being studied. But when you have a PPP, you can actually leverage on the know-how of, of the private company. Like in the case of Siemens, all that research that has been done and all the investments that have been made in, in research. And now you can harness on that technology. And in addition to getting all the benefits that you have described also allows the city to have important uh, financial partnerships because we can bring money from the future to the present because we will find financial mechanisms that will make the city viable. And one thing that we must highlight here is that while cities are driving global transformation, we also have to call upon the federal governments and the, the, the national governments so that they invest more in cities that are the drivers of growth. In many cases, and with other fellow mayors, we, we have spoken about this need of uh, needing uh, uh, financial resources, and we need to use those monies to work on human development. There are people who are listening to us. There are people from the audience here. And maybe we will give the floor later to them. And there will be people say, like, oh, this sounds so beautiful. PPP, service management, bureaucracy, access to tax payments, etc. So please, just give me a clear example, one specific example, on how this management has benefited the quality of life of your citizens. Would you dare to do to do that? Would we start by Mr. Uh, with the mayor of Medellin? Well, yes. I want a clear example of management and saying we started this program like waste smart waste management, and that has resulted in and then the outcome. Well, no, this is just by way of example. I mean, you can speak about any other topic. No, but uh, waste management is important. As I have told you, we have just bought the waste management company, uh, it was a public company owned by the, by, by the city, and then we changed the whole pool of uh, collection trucks. And I think that that fleet is now one of the f first uh, vehicles of, of, of operating with natural gas. So we are having a vertical integration plus uh, with the natural gas, and we're working that with the EPM group. So we're buying the gas from our own company. So that brings benefits not only from the uh, point of view of sustainability, but it has also improved waste management. Well, here, uh, I will give me an example. No, no. I, have, I want to speak about education. In both cities, we are making a lot of effort and to develop uh, layer of technology specialists, especially regarding the Internet of Things, which is with, which will allow at the, end the digitization of cities. In fact, in Latin America, we have educated over 800,000 students. So we have to bring them into uh, the process. And it is the Internet of Things and PPPs that play a key role. Un ejemplo muy específico, el 
podemos hablar de lo menos sexy, que es, eh, que es eh, los rellenos sanitarios y la recolección de basuras. Nosotros estamos incorporando a empresarios en nuestras estaciones de transferencia de residuos para que ellos nos digan cuáles son los artículos que los ciudadanos de Fimix están tirando a la basura y que nosotros podemos sacar y reciclarlas y ponerlas en el mercado, porque ellos pueden tener mejores ideas que nosotros. Nosotros tenemos que, mejor, que mejorar eh, la el índice de recolección de basura, tenemos que tener menos impacto en los rellenos sanitarios. Entonces estamos incorporando gente nueva que nos va a dar ideas nuevas y que nos pueda ayudar a arreglar las cosas menos atractivas y menos bonitas que hacemos, que es como la recolección de basura. Entonces este es un ejemplo de cómo estamos utilizando el sector privado en hacer servicios innovadores. Yo lo sé, yo lo sé. Siempre hay cosas feas que se tienen que hacer. If I can, I'll do, I'll tell you about two things. The senior citizens have to enroll in a process to, to show, to prove that they are alive and that they have uh, that to, to, to receive their entitlements. Sometimes they had to stand in line for three or four hours, and now they can do it through voice recognition. They can just make a phone call It, it was a significant investment on technology, but they can just give a proof of life through uh, a telephone call. Before, they used to even have to pay uh, an ambulance to take them, just to give a proof of life, to be able to receive their entitlements. So, so that was one. And another one, uh, the, other, the second one is an application where you can pay your taxes, your local taxes, and you can keep your file of your payments and you have never, never have to go and stand in line again. You can actually connect your credit card to the app and then you will be able to transfer the uh, payment. Control systems, probably because I take it very personally with all the time I spend in traffic. But um, th we've been able to, in London, for example, have a toll system which is actually variable in the center of the city so that if it's peak hours it's more expensive if it's off hours less expensive it's increased traffic rates by more than 37 percent in the city and i can add to that in russia their main artery is also controlled by a siemens distribution and control system which has allowed the artery to again significantly improve its traffic capacity with monitoring control and guidance. So I think those are things that can really help all citizens, me included, to uh, have a better experience in the city. I believe that from all the examples that you're giving to us, we all hear mo mobility. Mobility would be the common denominator. And I think that we should bring mobility now to the floor as our topic of conversation. You were speaking about how improving, uh, how reducing people's mobility so that they can pay their, uh, uh, give proof of life. If you were speaking about a parking and cutting down on times and, and traffic, the mayor of Phoenix is attempting to improve the public transportation system. So I don't know who wants to speak about mobility and I, and I spoke and I was referring to what you to you because you were telling me before we started our program that this is one of the areas with the largest amount of growth in the country and that your obsession or your goal is to reduce transportation individual transportation it's a western city in the United States which has grown expansively for so many years post World War II now we're going urban and we're going urban for a variety of good reasons Number one, this is what the millennial generation requires. If you want to keep your millennials in your city, you want to attract millennials from around the country or the world to come to this, your city, you better provide a great urban environment. Great transportation is arguably the most important part of providing that urban uh, environment. So I'm going to the voters in just a couple months and asking for a significant expansion of our light rail Uh, system. We're going to go up to 60 miles across our <coughs> city and to get it further and further out into the parts of the city, even in some of the lower income parts, so more and more people have access to transportation to go to get a university education, get to their employment, uh, get to their doctor's office, whatever it may be. And along the, light, the existing light rail line, there's already been $7 billion of investment, mostly in residential, because 
So many people want to live along the light rail line. One thing we discovered about investment in transportation, it's not just good for attracting and retaining millennials, but a lot of empty nesters want to move from the outskirts of town to the center of the city near light rail so they can be closer to the art museums and some of the civic centers, uh, et cetera. So it's both good for young people and for uh, empty nesters, uh, retired citizens that want to change their lifestyle once their kids are out of the house. It's good for our, for our city very much. Y si hay algún proyecto que Is there any project? Uh, there was one project that made Medellín more visible than any other city, and was, that was Metro Cable. Well, first we had to have a big umbrella project. One, one of the main problems in Latin America is inequality. And we, I, I am fully convinced that equality is built in public spaces. Public spaces have to be the spaces for equality. But again, the, the, be, the, be, the best public space available for equality would be transportation. In, uh, it, so it is not about a matter of mobility and transportation, but also to provide equality. So Metro Cable was the first. Uh, we, we built the first one, and now we have six different lines. And another core element is that we it, it, we have not only afforded safer uh, transportation or cheaper transportation, but we have also brought the government to places where it was very uh, that it was very far away from not so long ago. So in in September this year, we will be uh, having a pneumatic wheel tram. And what I mean with, with this is that th this is another way of innovation because it is a new mode of transportation. Uh, we are very uh, different from Phoenix. But, but, but we, we had the cable cars and now we have uh, trams with pneumatic wheels because we have many slopes. Maybe we're different from Phoenix in our geography. Well, this mayor had a challenge, and now there's another mayor trying to beat that other mayor in another point of the continent. So now that you are starting your new transportation <coughs> system in Phoenix, do you want to ask anything to somebody who faced challenges just as you are facing today? Uh, the number one thing I need to do is build public support. Right now, we've got a political campaign because I mentioned earlier, I can't rely on the federal government to pay for this in a city like mine. A city like Phoenix needs to be much more self-reliant. So I have to go to the, the citizens and ask them to finance a system as large as we're trying to uh, plan now. So I guess my advice would be uh, how, to, how to your advice about building public support for public transportation, particularly since so much of the transportation is going to be benefit citizens that are lower income. But lower income citizens don't tend to vote in the higher numbers. So I've got this uh, political issue I've got to deal with, but it's right for my city. ¿Algún consejo, alcaldes? Yo, te... Brevemente, y le vamos a dar también la palabra. Would you like to give a piece of advice? Well, regardless of the conditions of every city, the, mo the other most transcendental aspect as regards mobility is that we have to build cities that are less expensive and that mobility is built for citizens that are growing vertically rather than horizontally. So the best way to improve mobility is not having to, not having to move within the city. And that is one of the essential things that we are doing in Medellin. We are, plan are having our urban planning for the next 10 years, and our model this uh, does, does not uh, uh, want to promote uh, growth or expansion. We are aspiring to have citizens to bike their way through work or through home or through schools. Now we will have a mayor of Mexico City and the private sector. We have a small uh, commercial, and then we will come back to the discussion on smart cities in the in the WEF for Latin America. Seguimos? Okay. So we have 13 minutes before the end of our discussion and we are speaking about smart cities. We were speaking with Mayor of Phoenix, who is facing the challenge of how to build public support for a project 
like he wants to have and, and, and reduce the, inten the intensity of traffic. And then we have a mayor of Mexico City. How do you persuade your citizens for um, projects as big as th this one? Well, I believe that first we have to show it as something that is financially feasible, something that is socially acceptable, and as uh, the mayor was saying, also that is adequate for the needs of that population. For example, Mexico City was a city that was not planned at all. So we expanded and expanded and expanded. And this is why we have to build kilometers and kilometers and kilometers of thoroughfares. And so first we have to think, what type of city do you want? And I believe that most mayors in the world uh, agree that we have to build resilient, sustainable, concentrical cities, and that mobility has to be provided with a pyramid where first we have pedestrians and then build around that so that we can provide them for mobility by foot. And then we have to look at other ways of, uh, or, or other manners of mobility. In Mexico City, we have now a, a service of 7,000 uh, government-owned bicycles that are there not only used for um, the, p the purpose of leisure, but now they are used uh, to uh, move from one place to another. 80% uh, of our pollution in Mexico City has to do with public transportation, and we are trying to revamp or overhaul a fleet of over 20,000 small buses to a new fleet of last generation buses. Bueno, déjenme eh, comenzar por la parte de uh, capturar. Getting people excited about what they can imagine the result will be. And let me just say, use your imagination. Today in Paris, we have driverless trains that have much closer density, so you can carry more people quickly. You can then connect seamlessly with e-tickets to electric buses that have no pollution at all. And with traffic and control systems, you can move those buses and guide those buses much faster. So you can imagine your day-to-day -day life so much, so, so much higher quality with these types of, of things that are in practice today. These are not dreams. These are realities. Jordi, ¿cómo está tu imaginación, tu capacidad? No. What about you, Jordi? Well, we have to think that mobility has two sides to it, physical and virtual, and both sides are critical to improve competitiveness in a city, and that has to translate into specific actions, like job creations. Um, a city is, is competitive as long as it can create jobs for its citizens, and there are certain conditions that have to be met uh, for that. So in Mexico City, we have decided to create a world support, or worldwide or a global support center that provides services from Mexico City to everywhere. And here, mobility is key and education is key. We realized we ha that we had to educate people who had enough skills to feed into that innovation center. The city of Medellin, uh, they, they are thinking of mobility always, not only public spaces, but uh, what, what we want is to help the youth become more competitive and become more innovative and that they can be networking with the whole world from home. So building on what Jordi has said, I believe that the <coughs> two types of mobility, virtual and physical, are interconnected. I was uh, talking with him, uh, we're working with Cisco in uh, in teleworking, teleworking. So virtual mobility to favor physical mobility. So as lo so the more people are teleworking, we all, we'll also have less people uh, commuting inside the city. So in um, uh, Medellin, we have seven to eight percent of workers teleworking, and we have the goal of getting to 15% of teleworkers. And while figures are here not of the utmost importance, they, are, they may become, they are working, these teleworkers are for both the public and the private sector. We have to break the paradigms. Sometimes 
we, we believe that people have to be at, at, at work for eight hours. Why? Why do they have to be there uh, for eight hours? And then uh, we have, the, and this leads us to having uh, traffic jams because people have to be at the office at a certain hour and leave at certain hours. So in Mexico City, we are now studying the working hours of uh, government officials. So, and how do you deal with culture issues? Trying to be politically correct, I'm asking this question. So, if I'm, if I, do, if I stay at home, if I telework, will I be productive? How do you? secure how do you guarantee that productivity will be maintained in la well i think that you have to set yourself uh, goals and you have to set goals for uh, the the workers and for your employees so we were thinking about giving an extended maternity leave why would you only give them 40 days if you can always give them 90 days, and that will make women more productive. Uh, so if there were a majority of women here, they would be giving you a round of applause, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, 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 Miguel Angel was saying this, uh, teleworking in increases productivity. It does not go against productivity. It, it increases productivity because it, it, it opens the doors for, for many people who have problems to commute from home to work. And following on the same line as Mayor Mancera was saying, uh, referring to about women, we have, uh, the majority of our teleworkers are women because uh, some of them will have children who have a disability or a learning problem. And it is so much easier for them to be at home and in some way or another looking after their children or any other family member, and, and they can work as well. And that improves uh, productivity so much because it, if she has to go to the office, she will be always worried and then she wouldn't be able to concentrate. So we have to break paradigms. What is Phoenix doing about this? Are you encouraging teleworkers? Well, it, Yes and no. I would, I would even argue that there is a third option. Obviously, many people like to do their work in an office setting. Some like to do it at home, and some like to do it also in between. That's why in, in Phoenix, and I'm sure in the other cities represented here, co-working spaces are so common, where people may want to do some of their work at home, but using technology can go to a co-working location and get some work done, and then occasionally go to a more uh, formal option. In Phoenix, we want to make sure our employees and also our private sector employees they're as productive as possible. So we want to give them as many options as possible in order for places to do their work. Look, we are a much smaller city in terms of number of employees than we were five, six years ago before the recession. So we expect a lot more from each of our employees. We demand a lot more from each of our employees. And we want to give them as many options as possible, which also means we need to invest in technology in order to empower our employees to be as productive from as many places as possible. You can't turn it off in the evening. You can't turn it off in the weekends like you used to. If you're going to be a professional in the city, you're expected to be uh, productive uh, uh, at many more times. ¿Cómo ayuda el sector privado a fomentar el teletrabajo? Well, we don't see it as one way or another. We see flexibility as the key. That's the key word that we'd use in this, which is even in our own offices, we have flexible work hours. So you need to be there when you need to be there. And that some people come in at 6 in the morning, some people come in at 10 in the morning, and they adjust their hours around when they, they need to be there. But we also have the ability to do live meeting meetings so that you don't have to be there physically. What we found was to just say that you could work from home really only was relevant for some fa fairly limited number of jobs as a full-time application. But part-time, and now and then, when the work demands it, it's absolutely perfect. So I think that's the key to this, is flexibility on where and how you work. I agree with the, that uh, thing about flexibility. You were referring to culture. And I think that if we, if we think of the young, they do not think in a, in a linear manner. They are multidimensional. In fact, 
the uh, technology, uh, the virtual world allows them to be multidimensional rather than the physical world that only allows them to be linear. But they, ha it, you have to provide for an environment that allows them to innovate and be creative. And this is how we create an innovative world. And then we have to think of inclusiveness. Cities and communities that are more inclusive and more diverse are more creative and all more more innovating, and they are more competitive, and they are capable of creating jobs and aiming at a higher living standard. We have exceptional uh, guests today, and we are speaking about smart cities. So I would like to ask our audience to start taking part in the discussion. So I would like to ask our members of the audience to ask their questions. And tell us, please, who are you addressing your question to? <coughs> Hello, I am Alejandro Massa from Mexico City, from uh, uh, Global Shepherd, Mexico City Hub. My question is for M Mr. Mancera. Mexico City has been very successful in creating a young, innovative system attracting talent from all over the world. What has been the key to this success, and what could other Latin American cities learn from the success that Mexico City has had so far? Okay, La Ciudad de Mexico tiene. Well, thank you. Mexico City has a very specific vocation towards uh, this issue of youth. We've just participated with the UN to have one of the most powerful tools concerning a survey for youth. And, it, and we're talking of 1.5 million surveyed people. And uh, this task was in the hands of the country, but the city carried it, carried it out. But Oh, thanks to this, uh, we created a laboratory, innovation laboratory, and uh, it's uh, the first edition in Mexico City. We're talking of 500 youth programmers and so on and so forth. So we've had more than 1,200. It's called a hackathon. So Mexico City is requiring more and more uh, jobs of this type for it to become an intelligent city, to be able to contribute and shorten those distances. They're very long distances that uh, due to infrastructure issues and uh, uh, transportation is expensive. So therefore, this is a, an unequal city and we wish to do away with it. So that's what we're doing. We are promoting Wi-Fi, of course, we're promoting innovation, and we want the youth to have an opportunity to find the right job. Okay, and my question has to do with more or less the same. Let's invite youth, all the youth that are sitting at the WEF, but also those that are following us through the web, because in Medellin next March uh, in 2016, we will hold the World Entrepreneurial Congress. So therefore, that's an invitation for youth and, and not for not so uh, young, right? Of course, thank you, 15 minutes. They're politicians, by the way. When, uh, you know, we're not so young. What period, when, when were you born? Personal questions. Uh, please be very specific concerning your question. I will be addressing you in Spanish. Um, in regard to uh, how cities in Latin America are tackling the issues of crime and the growth of uh, slums, uh, which I think can't really be divorced from the concepts of urban mobility and some of the other areas we've discussed. Which brings the topic of security. Latin America eh, y el Caribe presenta la mayor... Latin America and the Caribbean have the highest rate of murders in, in the world average is 7 and 41 in the, the Latin American cities and the, the, the most uh, uh, criminal, there, where there's more criminality is in the Latin American countries. Here you are to seduce you, the mayor of Mexico City. Mexico City has a security system which is growing. Every time more it's growing. I'm going to give you figures. Mexico City, for example, on a daily basis, we have more or less two homicides, uh, willful homicides in Mexico City. And today, Mexico City, concerning the theft of vehicles, the 
we have the averages that we had back in 1991 when the number of cars back then was 1.5 million vehicles and today we have 5 million. No, don't talk about figures, please. How, what are you doing to improve security? issues. Well, how do you achieve these results? I believe that a basic requirement is for uh, cities to uh, use ITCs. You cannot have a coverage of a specific area man-to-man uh, -man in comparison to cameras, for example. Cameras in Mexico City are allowing us to find these stolen cars every day uh, at a high rates and uh, We are being able to arrest criminals and uh, also for preventive measures, in other words. So the use of technology and proper training and uh, all of this is allowing us to revolutionize this whole thing. Technology and innovation and betting issues. Technology and education is what, is, what are you doing in your city? of Phoenix on the issue of education first, we understood that we needed a higher educated workforce. One of our competitive disadvantages is that the percentage of young people with a college degree was below uh, the national average. So you know what we did? We, the city, paid for a campus of Arizona State University right in our downtown. That was unheard of across the United States of America to do that. But if you want a higher educated workforce, you can't wait for someone else to do it. You've got to be self uh, self-reliant. So we really, we were able to, by doing so, bring 10,000 students to downtown Phoenix, which has just totally uh, uh, changed the atmosphere and the vibrancy of our, uh, of our downtown. And 25% of the rides on our existing light rail, I was talking transportation earlier, are students, higher education. And so you can't, divorce, you can't divorce uh, uh, transportation investments from <coughs> educational advancement in your community. Those are very much uh, one and the same. It's a very exciting investment made by the city of Phoenix. And, and that investment increased the security? Esto ayudó a mejorar la seguridad? Oh, I, well, for, we're, we're very lucky in the city of Phoenix on the security issue. I, um, uh, I apologize. Uh, we're at about a 40-year low uh, relative to our uh, crime rate. One issue that we have is, of course, body cameras. You hear about police shootings in the United States of America. Major American police forces, including Phoenix, want every single one of our officers to have a body camera. If you know about that technology, you know that the body camera is actually inexpensive. It's managing the data uh, that's very, very expensive, and we're just learning how to do that now. So we're up to about 200 cameras in Phoenix. We have about 2,800 police officers, so we have a long way to go. But we want to make sure that if we're capturing the data uh, on police interaction, that we're able to manage that data as well. And we're struggling like many other cities across the United States. Sí, de alguna forma ahora yo mencionaba que... I was saying that the great issue in Latin America is inequality, but the other issue which is implied, of course, is violence, criminality. We have the highest rates of inequality and the highest rates of violence and criminality, and of course, all of this is linked. I believe that the, re um, the recipe we've used in Medellin has transformed things. You know that 20 years ago, our city had the greatest criminality rate in the world, and now we've, we've gone down a 96%. Therefore, that's the definite recipe. Of course, we need to uh, handle these criminal gangs, technology, improvement of law enforcement. We have to work together between law enforcement, the mayor's office, the prosecutor's office, the jail system, and so on and so forth. But the other important issue has to do with opportunities. We have to help thousands of youth that through the lack of uh, their possibility of obtaining a job fall into a dark path or drugs. So that's the perfect mix. In other words, it's the mix between authorities and opportunities. That's an important issue. I do agree. Now, there are two basic items. First is physical security. We've, it's been explained properly. Technology can help out. But the other thing is cyber safety. The industry of uh, crime is of 
billions of dollars. It's, it's, it's growing and it's industrialized. So if we uh, create smart cities, we will have sensors, which are access points in the network. So security in the network is a, a key issue for the proper working of a city. We're talking of security matters, which will allow prevention, but also inclusion and avoid criminality. Okay, now there is an additional item which is the recovery of the public space. The greater public spaces you recover, less criminal activity. A site where you may see the concentration of people they, that are criminals, if you recover those spaces for the community and it becomes the citizenry community, you will help out. Y los datos. Actually, these days have a city dashboard, which will pinpoint where there are issues. You may have it from your cameras, you may have it from your police force, and actually get help there very fast. But the other thing that data can be used for, and New York City did this very successfully decades ago, is they actually found that if you use statistics to see where these criminal activities were happening, you could narrow down not only where the activities were, but it turned out being few people. It's not everybody, it's a few people, and they could concentrate on capturing and, and prosecuting those people, and it made an enormous difference. So it's not just responding to today's event, it's also using that, that whole field of data to make a difference. I do understand that what we're saying, it's, it's not thefts in a store, but also the use of public transportation, because if it's unsafe, public transportation, people won't use it. And this happens in cities in Latin America. At present, Mayor, would you like to add something? I'm going to add about, we started with a question about what makes a smart cities and use of data, data-driven decision-making I think is going to be an increasingly important aspect for leaders across the globe in uh, decision making, using data on crime fighting, using data to build a better transportation uh, system, using data uh, to improve your waste and recycling uh, systems within uh, your city. All of those systems can be improved by use of open data, meaning that the city provides all the data that we, that we collect, provide that openly and allow the people in your community access to that data, and they can provide the solutions, in many cases, better than you can come up with your own solution. That's another way of gaining citizen engagement. So data-driven decision-making combined with open data is a very powerful tool for the future. The last few words, we're about to finish. Your name, the question, and here, you, who you are addressing that question to. De viva voz. John Huko from Rotary International to all of you. Now, which is the role that civil society NGOs may play in trying to solve these issues and challenges? It has, civil society has a fundamental role. Civil society, of course, uh, in different fronts. Mexico City has uh, civil society participating on environmental issues, civil society participating in infrastructure issues, planning for the city as well. In other words, they and many ideas of NGOs that thereafter become public policies. A very quick case I'll mention is that of the search of adults when uh, elderly people rather when they're lost if they suffer some, from some sort of disability. And there was an initiative in civil society to create uh, the, an alert. It's called the Silver Alert, and it's been extremely effective in trying to locate the uh, elderly. I believe that the, there is much work uh, concerning citizens' participation together with uh, social organizations and NGOs. But let's talk about the, the uh, participation of citizens. We have a concept which has to do with pedagogical urbanism. M much work that we carry out have 
uh, they have constant they're constantly in touch with citizens, not only on planning and designing, but appropriation and maintenance of infrastructure. So besides that univ universe is uh, to uh, um, feedback and also design uh, will, will convey success. Phoenix, how do, do you incorporate civil society in your projects? What the mayor um, uh, just said, look, Civil society is an incredibly important sounding board for ideas. We would not implement any of the ideas either that come from government or from the citizenry without first working with some of our civil society organizations. Rotary Club was uh, mentioned by uh, uh, the speaker. Many other organizations of active citizens who also provide almost a good housekeeping seal of approval. Even things like the transportation uh, initiative that we discussed uh, earlier I very much want to get the support uh, and approval in, of the civil society organizations within my city because then the citizenry will have extra confidence that this is the right, uh, the right plan. So the more citizen involvement we can get, the more citizen involvement, the better city we're going to be. The challenge as political leaders is you've actually got to listen to that citizen involvement. You can't just put it there as window dressing. You've got to really make sure that when they give you an idea, you do your very best to listen with an open heart and open mind and implement that idea. Estamos ya al final de este tiempo de análisis. We're at the end of this analysis of this very basic uh, framework. I can't close without asking you to summarize certain ideas. In other words, to give me the item or the element that will define an intelligent city. Let's begin with the private sector. Integration of people, data, systems, and everything working together to make a better tomorrow. I do agree with your remark, but although the perception exists in the political sector, in society, we still need financing and prioritizing all these projects. Financing is extremely important in Latin America to, to make the economy and community uh, integrate. Innovation, of course. So therefore, first of all, we need to prioritize budgets. Uh, the, with the government, with the cities, we have to invest in this and uh, the institutions with the IDB or other international banks to help out Latin America to, to achieve this. As much information out to the public as uh, possible and make sure you're getting the best ideas from the public and that's everyone. A city like Phoenix is a wonderfully diverse city with many nationalities represented, people from all over the globe. We need to make sure that all of our, our ideas are taken into place. So I would say uh, open data, data-driven decision-making, and then as much public involvement as possible. Those will make you a leading city in the future. I believe that what we've said here, we need to say that for the, a city to be a smart city, of course, planning, the usage of IT, participation of the private sector, of citizenry, participation of the vulnerable sectors, and to try to be a fair city. I believe, uh, well, I ha I'll, I'll, I'll repeat what I've said today, which is the political credo that we have in Medellin. Obviously, if the most serious issues the Latin American cities have is violence and inequality, a smart city needs to handle those two issues with real results. It's not the goal, but the means how to create and consolidate cities for life, and cities for life mean less violent cities that respect life and uh, ch challenges public private uh, partnerships so thank you thank you so much for providing a uh, greater knowledge concerning what a smart city is all about so let's continue connected on the end TN24, the channel of Americas, to listen to this discussion again. And all of you, the audience present, thank you so much. A big round of applause.